she's a lot better than I am in that. And um, she is very well experienced in HIV, TB, and STI clinical management. She's dedicated, she's self-driven, and she's exceptionally capable. She got her original degree from the University of Zimbabwe, her MBCHB, and she also has a diploma in HIV from South Africa and an MSc in biostatistics and epidemiology. She also has an EMBA. She is a passionate leader and a mentor who is involved in adding value to the health profession through her leadership roles and involvement with organizations such as the College of Primary Care Physicians of Zimbabwe, the Medical and Dental Practitioners Council of Zimbabwe, and the World Organization of Family Doctors. So Agnes, I'd like to welcome you. I saw you do this presentation a few weeks ago at the Zimbabwe Medical Association, and it was exceptional. So I am very much looking forward to tonight. Thank you for joining us. All right, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stone. I think I'm going to turn off my video to increase the bandwidth. Can you all hear me clearly? Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. That's fine. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. Everyone, good evening, and thank you for being here today. I'm really honored to be here to speak about uh, something that I'm passionate about advanced HIV disease management, along with the challenges that it poses to disease management. As she indicated, I have a special interest in the business medicine interface. So the point, this is the point at which the field of medicine intersects with the commercial world. So I'm very glad that we have practitioners from the private and public sectors as each faces a unique set of, challenging, of challenges when managing our advanced HIV disease. And I'm glad that we also have uh, the intellectuals campus representatives who are actively involved in knowledge management. So having a wide set of stakeholders allows us to have a thorough dialogue about the various facets of managing advanced HIV disease. I'm trying to move on to the next slide. Agnes, right. oh, perfect. Um, use the little keys. I find them a lot easier. Sorry, I'm probably technologically challenged as most doctors <laughs> are. So I use, no, use the keyboard. It works better. Oh, okay. That's fine then. So uh, this is the presentation outline in the order in which the presentation will be structured. To set the stage for our discussion, I will start by exploring uh, what knowledge management is. So this is especially significant because it lays the foundation for understanding how we might use knowledge to navigate the complexities of HD management. In addition, we we'll examine the business medicine interface in the context of advanced HIV management, then we'll go into the nitty gritty of advanced disease management, including the HDR essential package. So as we all know, managing HIV can actually be a complex task that involves not only the medical, the clinical aspect, but it also involves addressing the social, psychological, and the economic aspects of the disease. So given that uh, no patient or recipient of care is completely private or public, we have seen that recipients of care move between the public and private healthcare settings for their chronic needs. So we would not really be concerned about these transitions if the care provided in both settings was consistent and seamless. However, I'm sure you can agree with me that challenges arise when there are discrepancies in the quality of care, access to medications, and coordination between the public and private healthcare providers. So I, I thought it prudent uh, 
and it's crucial for us to understand the unique challenges that advanced HIV disease presents in both the settings. And by discussing these challenges today, we can actually gain a better understanding of how to improve the overall care and outcomes for individuals presenting with advanced disease. So this is where uh, the concept of knowledge management in practice comes into play. So now I'd like to uh, briefly discuss knowledge management. And as we all know, the medical healthcare, uh, the healthcare industry is a knowledge intensive or knowledge based industry. It simply means that our assets as healthcare providers are not physical products, but rather uh, we have knowledge uh, based assets. Our assets are the knowledge and expertise we we possess collectively and individually. So in this competitive healthcare market, uh, where technology is actually uh, rapidly advancing and seems to be competing with the traditional healthcare system and conventional healthcare business models, it is very crucial for us to make sure that we have adequate knowledge resources that address not only the clinical aspects, but the business and administrative aspects of healthcare as well. So for those who are not familiar with the knowledge management as a concept in practice, knowledge management actually refers to the, to the process of capturing, organizing, and utilizing knowledge within an organization or industry. And this is done uh, with a goal to, to improve decision-making and enhance overall performance. So it involves the creation of knowledge repositories and the implementation of knowledge sharing platforms. So it also involves uh, the development of strategies to promote continuous learning and innovation. So for those who are not familiar with it, it is not just a buzzword, it is actually a strategic and management approach that organizations with knowledge are best assets such as ours can use to improve performance, foster innovation and gain a competitive advantage. And I have uh, noted that Intellectus Campus with its tagline excellence uh, through knowledge has knowledge management at its core and is actually well positioned to harness the power of knowledge by effectively manage, managing their knowledge and resources. So for us uh, to benefit from our knowledge-based assets as the medical um, health industry, we should have, we should make sure that the knowledge we are creating through our medical curriculum is adequate to address the specific needs and challenges of our industry. Unfortunately, from the study I did, it was a common thread in most medical school uh, curricula to focus primarily on the medical knowledge and completely ignore the importance of other essential skills such as management and having a, a good business acumen. So uh, if you've noted from my first-hand experience uh, in the private sector, this narrow focus has been shown to limit our ability to effectively navigate the landscape, uh, especially in private practice. And it is through this uh, sensitization that I had that I've decided to take a different approach to the practice of medicine and to take it um, from a holistic perspective recognizing the importance of not only medical expertise, but also a well-rounded skill set. So the benefits of this approach uh, of this approach are many. They include enhanced uh, operational uh, efficiency within healthcare organizations while optimizing our um, the health outcomes of our patients. It also includes uh, the creation of sustainable and competitive healthcare uh, business models that can adapt to the changing market needs and deliver high quality services. And just as importantly, it allows us uh, to foster, it fosters their innovation and collaboration. Then, uh, so what do we mean exactly by advanced HIV disease? So uh, according to the July uh, 2021 consolidated guidelines, 
For adults, adolescents and children older than five years old, advanced HIV disease is defined as either uh, a CD4 count of equal or less than 200 or a WHO clinical uh, stage three or four condition. And in addition to this, all HIV infected children below the age of five years are categorized as having advanced HIV disease. And please note that one may ask, why the threshold of 200 for the CD4 count? Well, it is so because beyond this point of immunosuppression, people living with HIV become increasingly vulnerable to multiple opportunistic infections. The major ones being uh, TB, cryptococcal meningitis, the severe bacterial infections, and each of these were targeted by the interventions in the who recommended uh, package of care. Moving on to the global update, now one may wonder. Like, so if, check for my earphones on the one of the baskets. All right, Doctor, can you mute your mic? So uh, one may wonder why, especially in this era of wide access to art and the expansion of the eligibility criteria for HIV treatment to treat all, why is advanced HIV still a concern? So the reality is that despite progress in treatment and prevention efforts, the global burden is still high with a significant number of individuals being diagnosed late in the course of HIV infection. So according to the World Health Organization updates, HIV has claimed 40.4 million lives so far with ongoing transmission in all countries globally. And there was an estimated 39 million people living with HIV at the end of 2022. And what's unsettling is that two thirds of whom were in the uh, African region. And in 2022, 630,000 uh, people died from uh, HIV-related uh, causes, and 1.3 people acquired HIV. So in terms of the 95-95 uh, targets at global level, in 2022, 86% of people knew their status. Of these, 89% were on art, and of these, 93% were virologically suppressed. So uh, now in order to fully appreciate why we are still witnessing AHD in this era, we can do some simple maths. I, I'm a biostatistician again. So uh, uh, we, if we do simple uh, mathematics, we may find some answers, some of the answers that we are looking for. So let's consider the people who are outside the new 95-95 targets what is commonly referred to by some as the inverted cascade. So having 86% of people living with HIV who know their status would still mean that we have 14% of people living with HIV who do not know their status. So these people would remain at risk of transmission to others and of progressing to advanced HIV disease. And furthermore, if a disproportionate percentage of these people are from key populations such as sex workers, then the transmissions are resulting from this population will actually continue to contribute disproportionately to new HIV infections and mortality. And the same could be applied to those who are not on art, those who are not fully suppressed. So now consider the cumulative implications for HIV control. So this actually demonstrates that even in the era where uh, effective art and treatment interventions exist, we may still continue to see people presenting late in the course of HIV. We may still continue to record new HIV infections. Then uh, this slide is just a snapshot of the Zimbabwean context, uh, illustrating the prevalence of HIV in clients initi initiating art between 2015 and 2021. So from the graph, you can tell that there's a notable downward trend in HIV prevalence, which can actually be attributed to the new uh, testing strategies that include index testing, 
the decentralization of the art uh, program in Zimbabwe and the wide access to viral load monitoring. Again, if you follow the trend, you can see that while progress is still happening here, the rate of decline in, HIV, in the HAD, uh, AHD prevalence has slowed down in recent years. Now, uh, moving on to the complexities of managing patients with advanced HIV disease. Why is managing AHD complex and challenging from time to time? So the first being the issue of multiple comorbidities. So as the disease progresses, people living with HIV become increasingly vulnerable to a variety of opportunistic infections and malignancies. I've actually seen um, patients with tuberculosis, cryptococcal meningitis, Kaposi sarcoma, all at once, which can make management very complicated and difficult. Then for those returning to care after a period of interrupting treatment, the issue of missing details about the past medical history can complement the treatment choices. So we occasionally see people who return to care after stopping treatment. And if you ask them about their, about their previous treatment um, history, they may tell you that they don't recall anything and you all know that omitting crucial information about the art history may actually result in the selection or administration of medications that are inappropriate for them, and this can be a significant challenge in managing their care. Then let's talk of the unspoken pressure to start ARVs. Sometimes they will tell you that I will not leave the facility without my art regimen. Doctor, do you want me to die? Do you want our relative to die? So it is crucial to balance the agency of starting art with ensuring that patients are properly evaluated and monitored before beginning treatment. Additionally, it is also important to provide education and counseling to patients and their families as well about the benefits and potential side effects of art, which can help alleviate some of the pressure that they put on us. So it's a delicate a balance between the patient wishes and what's best for their overall health. So this slide is meant to just demonstrate how challenging it can be to treat patients with advanced HIV disease. Then it is also equally important to just look at the unique challenges of managing HIV in the private sector. And the distinct feature of the private sector is the reliance on individual insurance cover their medical aid or out-of-pocket expenses for the healthcare services. So now if our public health facilities where consultations, the arts medications, laboratory investigations are provided free of charge. And if these facilities are still having trouble keeping patients engaged in care, what more so in the private sector where patients have to pay for every aspect of their care in the fee-for-service delivery model? We ex sorry. Do we have any reason to believe that the management of HD in the private sector can be any better? Additionally, in the public sector, uh, we can harness the transformative power of a multidisciplinary team approach to make sure that we provide a comprehensive health care for patients with AHD. And this approach involves collaborating with um, different healthcare professionals from various disciplines such as the doctors, nurses, psychologists, social, health, uh, social workers to address the specific needs of the client. But now in contrast, uh, in the private sector, we have to take into consideration the financial aspect, which may limit first the availability of resources, and it may also hinder the implementation of a multidisciplinary approach and potentially compromise the quality of care provided to clients in the private sector. As if the challenges were not enough, 
While HIV services are being provided in the private sector, data from this sector is conspicuously absent, as you can see in the slide. So without access to the data from the private sector, it can become very challenging to assess the effectiveness of healthcare interventions and to make informed decisions even at um, national level. And also the lack of data from the sector makes it very hard to identify or address any discrepancies or differences in healthcare outcomes between these two sectors. Therefore, the sector needs, we, we need to work together and share information to ensure that we will provide consistent, holistic, and evidence-based uh, medicine to our patients. Can you still hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you, Agnes. All right, then. So now, before, all right. So now, before we delve into the clinical aspects of advanced HIV management, I'd like to just explore some strategies that can help address the, uh, the challenges of advanced HIV disease in the private sector. So in order to address some of these challenges, effective knowledge management systems need to be implemented. These systems can help healthcare providers stay up, uh, updated on the latest treatment guidelines and protocols and ensuring that patients receive the best possible care. And second, it is also crucial to develop innovative revenue models that cater specifically to patients with chronic uh, diseases such as HIV. So these models uh, can focus on providing affordable and accessible healthcare services that not only cover the cost of medications or consultations, but also provide additional services such as counseling, support groups, to help patients manage their conditions effectively. And from first-hand experience, the fee-for-service model, where patients are charged for each individual service or consultation, can be burdensome, especially in our economic environment, for patients living with chronic diseases who then require frequent medical attention. So implementing alternative payment models such as uh, bundled payments or subscription-based revenue models should be explored in the private sector just to ensure that patients receive the care they need without facing financial burdens. And these alternative uh, payment models can actually provide a more cost-effective approach by consolidating multiple services into one single payment and then uh, offering a fixed monthly fee for access to care. So this not only helps alleviate the financial strain on our clients, but also encourages uh, better adherence to treatment plans and improve uh, the overall health outcomes. Then how can the private sector address the lack of a multidisciplinary approach? So the private sector can actually address the lack of a multidisciplinary team approach by partnering with healthcare providers from uh, for-profit or non-for-profit organizations to establish what we call collaborative uh, care models. And these involve creating platforms for case discussions and knowledge sharing among the different healthcare professionals such as the doctors, nurses, social workers, and psychologists. Additionally, the private sector can also invest in training and education programs to enhance the skills and knowledge of healthcare professions or professionals. And I always say that in the private sector, no one has the luxury of ignorance because you need to have knowledge of HIV management across the HIV care cascade. That is from the preventative uh, aspect, the diagnosis, 
treatment and ongoing care beyond viral suppression. So this includes understanding the latest advancement in art, monitoring viral load and CD4 count, managing opportunistic infections, and addressing the mental health needs and social needs of patients. And that is why at the beginning of this session, I just thought it prudent to discuss effective knowledge management as a powerful tool for navigating the complexities of HIV management in the private sector. Then additionally, uh, collaboration between private healthcare providers, the government, laboratories, and not-for-profit organizations can actually play a very critical role in creating sustainable solutions for managing not only advanced HIV, but also other chronic diseases. And by working together, these stakeholders can put their resources and expertise to develop comprehensive programs that address the unique challenges faced by its sector. And additionally, from experience, Doctors can also collaborate even with pharmaceutical companies to negotiate lower prices for medications, making them more affordable for patients living with chronic diseases. Now we are moving on to the clinical management of our advanced HIV disease. So now what are the paths to AHD? Which patient population can present late in the course of HIV infection. So the path to AHD can be categorized into three, namely treatment naive who present with AHD. And then we have uh, the treatment experienced uh, who then interrupt treatment. And then we have the treatment experience who progress to advanced HIV despite being on art. And I believe there is value in just taking time to understand the factors or the circumstances surrounding late presentations, late diagnosis and treatment interactions. And this will help us to anticipate, plan and advocate for interventions that address the gaps. So let's examine the factors associated with AHD among the treatment naive. So first, it, it is very saddening to know that some people actually progress to advanced HIV disease and subsequently die without ever being diagnosed with HIV. And this is commonly, um, this is common among the marginalized populations, such as men who have sex with men, sex workers, and those marginalized by geographical location. Because even here in Zimbabwe, we still have regions that are not being reached by preventative interventions, such as the behavior uh, change massaging, condoms, with no access to HIV testing services. And since many of these people are dying outside of healthcare facilities, non-reporting of the underlying cause of death can actually make it difficult to collect uh, good data on the relative size of this population. Then we have uh, those who die, who, those who frequently uh, visit healthcare facilities, but have never been offered an HIV test. And this is particularly the case, I'm sure you can agree with me, with the elderly population. First, we don't perceive them as at risk of acquiring HIV. They don't see themselves as a risk, but several studies have actually shown that older age was found to be associated with uh, late diagnosis, partly because the HIV symptoms in older people were misjudged as other age-related illnesses. So healthcare providers were actually less likely to even consider an HIV test in this population. So yeah, it means that the elderly population is really a target for HIV, even the HIV preventative efforts. So all these factors can contribute to late diagnosis in this population and late presentations with uh, advanced HIV disease. So what does it mean to our healthcare providers? It means that we need to make efforts to improve HIV testing practices in order to reduce these missed opportunities. 
And then we have uh, those who are just reluctant. They just don't want to get tested until after they've experienced an HIV-related illness. And several studies have actually tied the male gender to poor health-seeking behavior. Then moving on uh, to the factors that are associated with disengagement with K. So people living with HIV may start out but subsequently discontinue for a variety of reasons. And one of the most common reasons being treatment fatigue, they just get tired because art requires a lifelong adherence to the medication. And sometimes it comes with inconvenient scheduling, the adverse side effects and the lifestyle changes. So treatment fatigue is therefore a notable challenge for a sizable number of patients. Then we have some who are tested but are either not linked to K or are lost during K transitions. And this is commonly due to insufficient information at the time of transfer or linkage. And it can be time consuming, especially for the healthcare workers to spend their time on the telephone trying to get clarifications between the facilities. It can actually delay care, lead to provider stress and an increased risk of patients being turned away without medication. And I'm sure some of us, especially those who work in the public sector, have come across you know, transfer letters with information that is often incomplete at best and at worst ambiguous or incorrect, which makes it very difficult to figure out how to proceed with patient care. So all these deficiencies of information and uh, lack of patient education and health and involvement in these transitions are a common threat to continuity of care and may lead to unplanned treatment interruptions and subsequent return to care with advanced HIV disease. And then um, one of the contributing factors whose impact is often underestimated is the issue of art stockouts or limited stocks. And by definition, um, the complete stockouts are the complete absence of a required medicine for at least one day at a storage or delivery point. And I'm sure you can agree with me that limited supplies and stockouts of any ARV that is routinely used is stressful, not only for the patients, but even for the healthcare providers. Because some of the coping mechanisms now that our healthcare workers employ is to shorten the refuel period from say three months to monthly supplies or weekly supplies, or to refer patients to other facilities which can actually rub salt into the wounds by increasing the financial burden for patients due to the additional transportation costs that will, that will follow. And in addition to the increased time away from work to pick up medications, it can potentially discourage patients from optimal adherence and continuing with care in order to safeguard their employment. Employment rates are very low in Zimbabwe. So anyone would do what they can to make sure that they safeguard their employment status. So all these factors can lead to unplanned treatment interruptions and loss to follow-ups. And in the private sector, I know firsthand how difficult it can be for patients to get the care they need because of financial constraints. Especially here with the harsh economic environment, many people are forced to choose between buying their art medications and eating. And this often leads to poor or suboptimal adherence. Then uh, for patients already in care, like I mentioned before, there's the issue of poor adherence, then art stockouts can also lead to suboptimal adherence. We also have people who may be adherent to arts, but nevertheless fail treatment. And this can be due to either transmitted or acquired drug resistance. So if the resistance is not identified early through routine viral load testing, these individuals will eventually progress to advanced HIV disease, despite adhering more to their medications. 
Then some people may initiate at, at the stage of advanced disease and despite reaching viral suppression, may experience prolonged suboptimal um, immune reconstitutions. And uh, multiple studies have actually shown that approximately 20% of severely immunosuppressed patients initiating art with advanced disease will experience what we call reconstitution failure. And there is data that suggests that treatment experience patients actually constitute an important share of people living with HIV suffering from advanced HIV disease. Then the following slide illustrates the key components of the WHO recommended package of care uh, for the management of advanced HIV disease. So this package of care consists of uh, expedited identification of those with advanced disease using the CD4 count, enhanced screening and diagnosis of TB and cryptococcal meningitis, along with other opportunistic infections, the third component is rapid initiation of art. Then we have the provision of enhanced prophylaxis, which includes cotrimoxazole, TB preventive therapy, fluconazole preemptive therapy, and adapted adhering counseling. Oh, yeah, there's a hand up. Dr. Pedros, you have the flow. Dr. Pedros, do you wish to say something? All right, I will proceed. So the provision of this package of care for people with advanced disease is actually supported by data from the reality clinical trial, which was conducted among individuals starting out in Kenya, Uganda, Malawi, and Zimbabwe, who had a CD4 count of 100 and below. It was later observed that persons with advanced, sorry, it was then uh, later discovered that uh, patients with advanced disease were not initially identified by clinical staging as having advanced, were missing opportunities to reduce severe uh, illnesses and mortality through the enhanced uh, screening and prophylaxis, the components three and four. So by identifying uh, people with advanced disease, it can actually help us to determine who needs screening for the pro, uh, and prophylaxis for opportunistic infections, because we now know that relying on who clinical staging alone to identify AHD misses a significant number of people with CD4 counts uh, less than 200, and almost half of those with CD4 cell counts of less than 100. So you can look up the reality study, which showed that close to half the people with CD4 counts less than 100 were classified as who clinical stage three or stage one or two. So this actually addresses the misconception that the default uh, testing is no longer relevant in our settings. So this slide just serves to reiterate the importance of CD4 testing in its role going forward. So who now recommends uh, CD4 testing for those first diagnosis HIV, those reinitiating treatment after a period of interrupting treatment for 90 days or longer, Moreover, CD4 uh, continues to have clinical uh, utility, especially for assessing patients' immune status at baseline, evaluating patients who are unstable on art, and monitoring patients' response to art in areas where viral load is not available. I hope we are still together. Then when it comes to the uh, manifestation of uh, opportunistic infections in patients who are immunocompromised, it is very important to keep in mind that the symptoms often lack specificity, contributing to misdiagnosis by many healthcare providers. For instance, 
Extra pulmonary TB is amongst the most difficult to diagnose because of the non-specificity of some of the symptoms. And furthermore, especially in the private sector, the screening process often comes with additional costs such as, uh, you know, the cost for ultrasound scans, CT scans, the finely do um, biopsies and so forth, which might be out of reach for many patients. And this may lead to further delays in art initiation, feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, in not only the patient, but the provider as well. And I'm, I'm sure most healthcare providers in the private sector can attest to this. And I do hope it's not contributing to high blood pressure in depression amongst our clinicians. And moving on to the leading causes of mortality among adults with advanced HIV disease. These uh, include tuberculosis, cryptococcal meningitis, the severe bacterial infections, we have toxoplasmosis, histoplasmosis, and PJP. And among children, uh, we have uh, TB topping the list, severe bacterial infections, PJP. So in line with the WHO guidelines for advanced HIV disease, I'll primarily focus on the screening and diagnosis of TB and cryptococcal meningitis. So just to uh, briefly discuss TB, it is the leading cause of morbidity and mortality among uh, people living with HIV, accounting for about one third of the estimated um, 770,000 people dying from AIDS-related deaths. It also remains the leading cause of HIV-associated hospi hospitalization. And whenever we mention hospitalization, there are costs attached to that. And uh, young children living with HIV has especially a high risk of progressing to TB disease following initial infection. Then uh, regarding cryptococcal meningitis, it is an important opportunistic infection that occurs primarily among people with advanced disease. And it is also an important cause of morbidity and mortality. And uh, by, it is by far the most common, uh, so cryptococcal meningitis is by far the most common presentation of cryptococcal disease. And it actually accounts for an estimated 15% uh, of all AIDS related deaths globally. And what's unsettling is that three quarters of which are in Sub-Saharan Africa. So less common presentations that we come across from time to time include the uh, pulmonary disease, skin, lymph node, and bone involvement. And um, in our setting, we are giving what we call preemptive therapy for cryptococcal antigen positive asymptomatic people, which is a key strategy to prevent cryptococcal meningitis. And in addition to this, primary and secondary fluconazole prophylaxis is also critical in preventing a cryptococcal disease. Then moving on. The next slide speaks to the screening and diagnostic tests for TB and cryptococcal meningitis. So uh, what has been added is the urine TB lamp, which is a point of care test based on the detection of mycobacterial lamp antigen in urine. And those for those who might not be familiar or who might want to know more about the lamp antigen, it is um lipopolysaccharide that is present in the mycobacterial cell walls, which is then released from the metabolically active or uh, degenerating bacterial cells. And it actually appears to be present only in people with active TB disease. And regarding the sensitivity of the uh, TB urine lamp, it is a sensitivity of about uh, between 50 and 70% depending on the CD4 count. And it is primarily used in the diagnosis of both uh, pulmonary and extrapulmonary uh, TB in HIV positive adults and children who have a CD4 count of less than 200 or who are seriously ill regardless of the CD4 count. And for the pediatric patients, it is also important to remember that urine lamb actually plays a critical role, although there's limited data. 
in terms of the positivity rate. So it is very important to keep in mind that urine lung plays a supportive or complementary role in the diagnosis of TB. It should never be used alone as a screening test for TB, but rather it should be used in combination with gene expert and other TB diagnostic tests, depending on the site of infection. And then as for our critical meningitis screening, the threshold was raised from 100 to 200. And this implies that everyone who meets the CD4 eligibility criteria for advanced HIV disease should be screened for cryptococcal uh, meningitis. Then uh, these are just uh, the, the minimum tests that should be conducted in all AHD clients. So we can see we have the CD4 count to identify advanced HIV disease along with the screen for opportunistic infections, urine lump serum craig for those with AHD. We need a full blood count. If you wish to put your patient on uh, AZT, the ALT creatine and given that tenofovir is now the first line. We also need cervical cancer screening, prostate screening, urinalysis, as well as screening uh, for opportunistic infections. So this was drawn from the operational service delivery manual. Then in terms of art initiation, Every patient with age the entering K should have a complete medical history, physical examination, lab evaluation, and should be counseled regarding the implications of HIV infections. So this means that conducting a thorough baseline assessment is particularly important. Number one, you want to rule out or diagnose existing comorbidities, which may impact not only the timing of art, but may also require treatment that interacts with ARVs. So it may also assist in the selection even of the ARV regimens. And for instance, if there is pre-existing renal impairment, you might want to avoid tenofovir and consider alternative regimens based on these in, uh, initial evaluations. And uh, moving on to TB HIV co-infection, if a patient is exhibiting TB symptoms such as uh, cough, night sweat, fever, or a recent um, unintentional weight loss, one should investigate for TB before initiating art. Then when the TB has been excluded, you may then proceed with art initiation and TB preventive therapy after excluding contraindications to the TPT, such as uh, pre-existing liver disease, chronic alcoholism, or non-hypersensitivity to the drugs. And if active TB is confirmed, the patient should be started on TB treatment and ads should then be deferred. And the timing of art initiation will be determined by the site of TB infection and the client CD4 cell count. And this means that if TB is diagnosed at a non-neurological site, such as uh, pulmonary TB or abdominal TB or TB lymphadenitis, art can be started within two to four weeks of uh, TB treatment, irrespective of the CD4 count. And the same applies for drug-resistant TB. But now, in the face of confirmed TB at a neurological site such as TB meningitis or tuberculoma, you need to defer art until four to eight weeks after the start of TB treatment. And lastly, if active TB has been excluded, please initiate art along with TB preventive therapy on the same day as art initiation. So currently, uh, the country is using, uh, we have two options to choose from in Zimbabwe. There's 3-HP and isoniazide. So in terms of efficacy, studies have actually shown that there's no significant differences in the incidence of TB between those on uh, 3-HP, which is a combination of rifapentin and isoniazide, and those on uh, a six months of isoniazide monotherapy. However, 
we need to be mindful of the risk of hepatotoxicity, which is significantly lower in HP in patients on a 3HP compared to IPT isoniazide. And 3HP regimens can be safely given with DTG, although caution must always be taken whenever you're co-administering drugs, you always need to look out for um, amplified side effects. So for some facilities, the use of isoniazide alone will continue uh, until they have uh, 3-HP. And with isoniazide preventive therapy, pyridoxine should be given con uh, concomitantly with isoniazide to prevent the occurrence of peripheral neuropathy. Then again, strict adherence to isoniazide is essential given that it should be taken once daily for six months. And uh, in the event that a patient is interrupted uh, isoniazide preventive therapy for say um, no more than three months, the patient can actually be restarted if they are asymptomatic. So in the case of uh, isoniazide preventive therapy interruptions of less than three months, the treatment can be completed over nine months. And this is for your own information, not for sharing with clients, lest they abuse such information. And then moving on to art initiation in the face of uh, cryptococcal meningitis, which we said is a major cause of mortality in people living with HIV. So before I go any further, it is important to highlight that the absence of symptoms of meningitis does not exclude cryptococcal meningitis because we now know that approximately one in three patients with asymptomatic uh, cryptococcal antigen actually has concurrent <laughs> cryptococcal meningitis. So who recommends rapid cryptococcal antigen testing? So you can use serum, plasma, or whole blood in all adults, adolescents above uh, 10 years old, who have a CD4 count of less than 200. And this is especially critical before starting ARVs. Reinitiating art after a period of interrupting uh, treatment of those uh, with suspected uh, treatment failure. But uh, with the cryptococcal antigen, routine screening is not recommended in HIV-infected children, especially those with CD4 counts of, um, uh, of less than 200, but are virally suppressed and are doing more on ARVs. Oh, oh, sorry, I need to explain the last point. So if your patient is exhibiting signs and symptoms of meningitis, such as an stiffness, intolerance to light, headaches, confusion, it is critical to investigate for meningitis before starting art. And if the serum craig is positive, a lumbar puncture for CSF, MCS, and biochemistry should be done unless it is contraindicated, and then art should be deferred. And if uh, cryptococcal meningitis is confirmed in CSF, there is need to defer art by up to uh, four to six weeks until antifungal treatment has been completed. Then moving on to the recommended treatment regimens and dosages for cryptococcal uh, meningitis cases. So in terms of uh, treatment, there are several options to choose from depending on drug availability. So there are three phases in the treatment of cryptococcal meningitis, namely the induction phase, consolidation phase, and maintenance stage uh, phase. And the drugs for the different phases and duration are summarized uh, in the following slides. So now in Zimbabwe, there's been a move towards a safer option, which is a liposomal amphotericin B. It is less nephrotoxic as compared to them for teratin B deoxylate and also has excellent tissue penetration and uh, tissue half-life. So in Zimbabwe, now the preferred option for, uh, for cryptococcal meningitis is liposomal amphotericin B, which is given at 10 milligrams per kg as a single dose, plus the flucytos in 100 milligrams per kg per day, and uh, fluconazole at a high dose of 1.2 milligrams 
daily for two weeks. Then in uh, settings where liposomo amphotericin uh, B is not available, we can continue to use the conventional uh, management and the conventional options for cryptococcal meningitis. Then in terms of um, the, the consolidation phase, so these are our options when it comes to the management of uh, lip of cryptococcal meningitis in, in settings where liposomal B is um, not available. So normally the induction phase is followed by uh, the maintenance phase, which includes uh, fluconazole, giving fluconazole 800 milligrams per day for adults or six milligrams, six to 12 milligrams per kg per day in children and adolescents for eight weeks. Then we always need to delay at by four to six weeks after starting uh, treatment for cryptococcal meningitis. And please take note that all individuals with a serum Craig positive but negative CSF Craig should be given what we call fluconazole preemptive uh, therapy which basically aims to prevent the progression of uh, the disease after infection is occurred. So we want to prevent the progression from the latent crypto infection to active cryptococcal meningitis. And uh, this involves giving the exact same dose as the maintenance uh, phases as treatment, uh, as treatment for the cryptococcal antigenemia. Then uh, in terms of uh, adverse uh, events and side effects, we need to look out for uh, potential interactions between our art medicines and TB medications, as patients with ASD may also be receiving treatment for TB. So while we are here, it is just important to highlight the importance of reporting adverse events across all sectors. I know this is not being done in the private sector. So please take note that um, people living with HIV with TB using rifampicin, the dose of DTG should be doubled to 50 milligrams twice daily. Then when it comes to cotrimoxas or prophylaxis, since the early years of the HIV uh, pandemic, we all know that cotrimoxazole or prophylaxis has been a part of uh, the standard care for people living with HIV and our HIV exposed infants. It is because it is a very cost effective way to just reduce morbidity and mortality. It is known to protect against uh, a variety of infections such as toxoplas uh, plasmosis, the PJP, diarrhea caused by isospora belly and cyclospora species. It also protects against certain bacterial infections, including bacterial pneumonia and urinary tract infections. So now, who, whose criteria for cotrimoxas or um, prophylaxis has slightly changed? It now requires or recommends a CD4 count, uh, cotrimoxazole in patients with a CD4 count of less than 350 or a clinical uh, or clinical stage three or four event or lifelong cotrimoxazole for any CD4 count in settings with high prevalence of malaria or bacterial infections with an area of uh, high malaria transmission being defined as more than one case per thousand population per year. So in addition to this, routine cotrimoxazole should also be administered to people living with HIV who have, uh, HIV, who have active TB regardless of uh, the CD4 cell count. And with regards to when to stop cotrimoxazole, according to our national guidelines here in Zimbabwe, cotrimoxazole may be discontinued for children or uh, who are five years of age and older, who are clinically stable, biologically suppressed on art for at least six months and uh, with a CD4 count of more than 350. And then for adults, pregnant and breastfeeding women, you can discontinue when clinically stable on art with evidence of immune recovery or viral suppression. And we, we, we now say in malaria endemic settings or areas with high prevalence of severe bacterial infections, once cotri has been started, it should not be 
stopped. Then in Zimbabwe, uh, in terms of the treatment regimen, yeah. is now the third first choice for, yeah. for first yeah. line with tough and abaca of a big bond being alternatives, which can then be combined with either a protein inhibitor or DTG. Then for the pediatric population, we have Zidolam and Rautegrava for our neonates, and then any two NRTIs with DTG from four weeks. Regarding special considerations in the pediatric populations, please note that uh, the DTG 10 milligram uh, dispersable score tablets are now recommended for use in children living with HIV who are at least four weeks of age and weigh at least three kilograms and can be used up to 20 milligrams. So this is for the 10 milligram dispersable uh, score tablet. And then for children who weigh 20 kgs or more, DTG50, which is a single film coated tablet, is now recommended in combination with uh, Abacave and 3TC. And then for children living with HIV who weigh 30 milligrams or more, uh, the fifth dose formulation of TLD is now recommended. So as we come to the end of the presentation, what are the key take home? Um, what is the key take home message? So the key take home message here is that addressing the challenges of advanced HIV disease actually requires a multifaceted approach that includes improving diagnostic capabilities, medication affordability, and accessibility across all sectors. So here we are saying, let's make sure that the medications are available even in the private sector. Let's explore the revenue models that can be implemented to ensure continuous service delivery and uh, ensuring the sustainability of our um, healthcare businesses. And then it is also crucial to ensure that healthcare providers and patients included have access to up-to-date information on the latest advancement in HIV management and uh, treatment options, the issue of effective knowledge management in the, EU, uh, in the healthcare industry needs to be emphasized. Then lastly, collaborations between healthcare professionals, uh, policymakers, pharmacies, laboratories is essential in developing strategies to address the unique needs of individuals living with advanced HIV disease. So we have come to the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I will now open the floor to comments, questions. Also feel free to just share experiences and challenges being encountered in managing patients with advanced HIV disease in your context. Over to you, Dr. Stone. Thank you, Agnes. That was a brilliant presentation. And I think I could watch it about four times because I, I watched it once and I learned even more this time. So I'd like to open the floor. I mean, I think for patient for doctors in the private sector managing HIV patients, one of the most stressful things is the financial burden to the patient. Um, and I'd be very interested to know from people in the region how they feel about managing many of these patients. So I'm going to open it to the floor and let's have an active discussion. Somebody put their hand up earlier. Um, Belle, can you tell who that was? Uh, good evening. Good evening, we can hear you. Yes, uh, Dr. Mtenje here, uh, working at uh, United Ulawa Hospitals. Uh, right. I wanted to share one of the challenges that we are having uh, with uh, managing uh, patients with cryptococcal meningitis. Yes, uh, we we know now that the, the recommended first line treatment will be a high dose uh, liposomal amphotericin B. But uh, the challenge that we are having is High dose lipotosomal amphotericin B is just super expensive. 
for the type of patients that we see uh, in our hospitals. I think a single dose, the single, the single recommended dose for for an average 70 kg men costs almost a thousand dollars. But I noted in Arare, the uh, many trials that are providing uh, our patients uh, with liposoma amphotericin B for free. So the challenge is uh, we feel like uh, patients uh, in Wulawa are being sidelined from uh, uh, benefits that other patients in Arara are also receiving. And also even the flu cytos in itself that's, uh, that, should, that is supposed to be given in the first week with the liposomal alpha cherries in B is also just super expensive for our patients. I think they need about $80 a day in times seven, seven days. And I think it's, a, it's something that needs to be looked at. And I don't know... Uh, if there are channels that we may uh, uh, try to use to address uh, this problem that we're having. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very important uh, point that you brought up, uh, Doc. Yes, we are really concerned, especially about the discrepancies um, in the quality of care we are providing. And you've brought up the issue of uh, geographical location, even at national level. So already we have problems talk of the discrepancies between the private and the public sector, because yeah, from what I've gathered, uh, there are plans afoot to, to roll out, especially the liposomal um, amphotericin B to all districts. I'm not sure in terms of progress, how far we have gone as a country, but I'm sure efforts are being made to just make sure that the drugs are available to everyone who needs them. Of course, we know Zimbabwe is Zimbabwe. There's the issue of the cost consideration issues waste for our patients in the pipe, uh, private sector. So it's also important to, to give our patients options because things are really hard in Zimbabwe. As I mentioned that patients have to choose between buying medications for, for themselves or even for their relatives. So if the patient is private, you can give them the option and refer them to a pu public institution where they can get access to the medications. So it's, it's also important to really know our referral systems so that we can advise patients accordingly. Thank you for bringing that up. We will take it up with the um, national team. Coordination team. Thanks very much for that question. Um, it's something that I, having been in the private sector, have really struggled with. Um, I worked in a low income area. And, you know, if a patient comes through the door and they've got $10 in their hand, how do you actually manage that patient? because you can refer them. Um, I've been certainly faced with a situation with a very, very ill patient in the private sector um, in a clinic that is on Samora Michelle Avenue. And I told the patient that he needed to go directly to the hospital. And he said, I've already been there, but everyone's on strike. So I think we need to also understand that you know, with the financial issue, the biggest issue, I think, with patients who may be seen as non-compliant is actually that they simply cannot financially afford the kind of care that we should actually be delivering. And I'd, I'd like opinions on that from the audience. Hi, Tim, especially for doctors in the private sector. Let's see our experiences. How are we managing these clients, given the cost considerations, et cetera, et cetera? How are we faring in terms of our HD management? Because as I've indicated, there is no data whatsoever for us to assess the effectiveness of uh, a disease management, even the treatment outcomes, how are we fitting in the private sector? No, I agree 100%, um, Agnes. And I think one of the other 
issues that comes in is the stigma associated with HIV. So a lot of people in the private sector do not want their data shared. Um, and it does, it creates an enormous problem. And maybe we should sit down with a sort of core group and a steering committee to see how we go forward in the private sector with HIV management. Because at the moment, and particularly after the last three years, where I think that supply chains were severely disrupted with lockdowns and things, I think that we really, really need to refocus on getting a group together of public and private doctors and NGOs and working out how to manage this um, in a way that patient confidentiality is maintained and that um, doctor stress levels actually come down because I find dealing with a patient who has limited resources very stressful um, in, the, in the private sector and I'm sure other doctors on this group will feel the same. Yeah, that, that is very true, uh, Dr. Stone, because here I have tried to come up with some of the strategies that we can try to implement in the private sector. They can actually go a long way in improving access to care and in also in ensuring the sustainability of our business models. Because especially in terms of cost, the revenue model, especially the fee for service revenue model, is not very feasible really because patients have to pay for every aspect of their care. Whereas in the private, uh, in the public sector, they can easily get access to the consultations, the free lab services, ultrasounds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So to ensure that the, the private sector survives as well, and uh, while optimizing the treatment outcomes for the clients. We may need to explore some of these uh, revenue models to see how we fail. There's no harm in trying. Absolutely. And, and that's always been my motto is that, you know, do something. And on that note, um, I'd like to announce that next week, Dr. Tedesi will be presenting on the latest updates from the HIV conference in Brisbane. And I think that maybe from here, anybody that's interested, um, please put your contact details in the chat. And I think maybe we should go forward from here with a, a steering group um, that includes Intellectus Campus um, with knowledge management and that includes um, pharmaceutical companies that are providing the ARVs and with NGOs and let's go forward with a plan that benefits every Zimbabwean and every sub-Saharan African to be able to access the care they need and to stop the transmission of this thing. Yeah, we've taken note of that. Thank you, Dr. Stone. Do we have any further questions, comments? Yes, uh, good evening. My name is Dr. Pazakava. I'm a junior doctor at Mpilo Central Hospital in Bulawayo. Um, I have a question. Um, my question is, um, what are some of the factors that might lead patients to going, seeking medical care at private institutions as opposed to um, the government where uh, ARVs, for example, are supplied free. Um, yeah, I, I just want to know what, uh, like perhaps maybe from the demographic, the people that you see, you might be able to. Oh yeah, it, that's a very uh, good question, uh, Doc. Oh, so far we don't have uh, like studies regarding the exact demographics of people who are seeking care in the private sector. But what we know that is people have the right to choose. They have that freedom to choice. 
And there's also the issue of uh, stigma and discrimination. Yes, we have really tried to deal with external stigma, external discrimination through public health uh, messaging, et cetera, et cetera. But very little is being done in terms of addressing what we call internal stigma. So our clients, some of them are still suffering from that uh, internal stigma where they, before, before like seeking care or before deciding where to go for care, they are concerned about what if I'm seen by so and so, and then they end up shying away from the public health care facilities. So I, I still think it's very important to help our clients deal with the internal stigma because it can actually hinder them from accessing services despite the wide access, uh, the decentralization of uh, HIV, healthcare, and so forth. So that in itself can hinder someone. Uh, in addition to the freedom of choice, they, they want private healthcare services and it's okay. What is important is to ensure that there is consistency in terms of the quality of service that is provided across the sectors. I hope you are Thank answered. You. Thank you. Tungani, you've just been um, seconded onto a committee because we need junior doctors rather than us um, aging uh older doctors so uh if you're interested and any doctor that is interested on this group i'd really encourage you to put your put your um either go into the chat and put your email contact and your contact details down but i do think that we really need to engage the junior doctors far more aggressively than we have in the past so thank you for your comments and um you may just find yourself roped into something you weren't planning on dr jackie sorry to interrupt um i've shared the sadek whatsapp group link so instead of people typing their their numbers individually they can just click on the link and join the whatsapp group that's great so we are now at least 20 minutes over time. So on that note, I'd like um, to thank you very much, Agnes. Your presentation was outstanding, and I hope to get you back in the future. And I hope that from this kind of meeting that we can get people together who want to make a difference. And apart from just being able to educate the doctors in the country, I hope we can actually get together as a group and get some sort of public-private partnership together so that we can collect the data and so that we can make a difference. And um, if anybody has anything else left to ask, please ask it now. Otherwise, I'd encourage you to put your names into the attendance register. And um, and CME will be organised by Bell. Um, and yeah, um, if nobody's got anything else to add, I'd recommend that we focus on a core group that takes us forward.